Hello and welcome in to eBible Fellowship Sunday afternoon questions and answers time, where you can interact with us with your questions and comments related to the Bible, and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. If you're calling us by phone, dial 209 647 1600 and then enter access code 181610, followed by the pound key, and that'll get you into conference. Then press star 6 and 1. If you're using Skype, simply press the free conference call button, then press your dial pad button and enter access code 181610, then press the pound key. And to get in line to ask a question, press star 6 and 1. If you're using Pal Talk, go to eBible Fellowship's room, and once there, you can raise your hand, and when you're called on, you can ask your question. And now, with Sunday afternoon's questions and answers, here's Chris McCann. Okay, thank you, and um, welcome, uh, everyone, to our Sunday evening question and answer time. Um, as you probably are aware, we had some difficulties earlier today with Skype, and that um, caused us to reschedule for this evening. Um, uh, uh, thank you for uh, be joining with us at this time. And Lord willing, we do hope to meet on Skype uh, each night during the coming week at 9 p.m. with Bible study and, and every Friday um, following the Bible study at 9.30 with another question and answer. Um, but at this time, we will open up the room. Everyone is welcome. Uh, really, uh, we do encourage you to share Whatever is on your mind, um, and I'll try to respond as much as possible by turning to the Bible. Now, let's go to the first person on the phones. Welcome to our Sunday evening question and answer time. Yes, good evening, Chris. Oh, yeah, good evening. Yes, yes, thank you for the lesson. It was very good. You made mention in the latter part of your lesson that um, the work that we've done, that was done um leading up to May 21st, let no man or anyone um, say that um, it was done um, to no effect. Uh, I would like for you to read um, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, and 58, please. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, and 58 says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That's a very good verse yeah. that that really fits all the activity that was um, involved in sharing the Bible's information leading up to May 21. It was a time of intense labor and you know, we, we make this statement, some people don't like to hear it, but it's the truth. God is in control completely concerning what we can know and also our lack of knowledge. And that that's just a fact. And so um, we we had studied, we had thought things would work out in a certain way, and we were incorrect about the rapture. We were incorrect about the nature of the five months, and and that is how God wanted it to be. And I and I say that, uh, or what I mean by saying that is that God could have corrected us early on, and He could have shown us the truth, but but it, it didn't happen that way. We maintained uh, a wrong understanding in certain areas and uh, without doubt this led to um, a more intense undertaking on the behalf of believers and also it, it led the world to pick up this information the news media and, and so forth and to broadcast it even further and, and wider afield and that was the purpose of God. It and and God is in control of those things. So yes, I would say God wanted 
these things to work out in the manner they did. And it also served an excellent purpose to set up a, a snare for the world in which they they could enter into the day of judgment and and when nothing happened uh, with according to their eyes they could feel a sense of relaxation and of 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 um that that the the danger is past and that's how the lord has set a trap and a snare for the world and at the same time this permitted god to set up a testing program for all those workers, for all those laborers, like, like um, many of us here, who were involved in getting this out. Uh, it, it, and, and like I said uh, or mentioned, some people signed up on May 20th and mm -hmm. maybe others two weeks before and maybe others two months before. And... And so um, it, it 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 sounded good to them, uh, and uh, all right, let me let me go do things God's way for a short period of time. Well, now of course the the test is: well, Did you really become a child of God? Are are you are you waiting on Him patiently? Do you still trust His word, and and so on? And so really. Uh, God, uh, in his uh, great wisdom, uh, set these things up uh, in, a, in a perfect way if we look at it from uh, this, this um, greater vantage point of having things pass. Amen. And, Brother, please, at, at, at that verse in Matthew 24, verse 14, really comes to play now because we know that God was in control. He has to be in control of all things. And I'm sorry, I, I wasn't able to hear you. What, what was that verse? I'm sorry, Matthew 24:14. There's a very familiar verse that we that we have learned, but that verse we know that God has that verse in the Bible for, forever. But and that was a command. I believe it was a command to the church, and that command was not carried out until God brought it into. Um, what was done prior to May 21st, and he used a small group of people, which we was involved in, in bringing this word to the world, and now that word has been fulfilled. So we looked at that verse many times, but that was God's doing, so the work that was done was not in vain. Could you read that verse in Matthew 24, 14? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, let me read it. In this gospel, the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And there's only one time in history that gets anywhere near um, fulfilling what this verse is saying, and that was the time leading up to May 21. It was unprecedented. There's never another time in the history of the world where Judgment Day was placed in the forefront of the world's eyes in the manner it was then and that's because it was of god to warn the world of what he was about to do and then he did it the the only the only thing is that we didn't understand it would be spiritual we we uh made an error in thinking physically when we should have learned from from things like uh, the judgment in the garden of Adam and Eve, when God said, in the day you eat of that tree, you will die. And then uh, uh, they did eat of the tree. And, you know, if there could have been an outward observer, which there couldn't have been because they were the only people, but but if there could have been an outward observer, who heard God speak those words to Adam and Eve, in the day you eat, you will die, and then witnessed them eat of the tree, and they did not die that day, nor for many days after Adam lived to be over 900 years old. The, an outside observer might conclude, well, either um, 
the, the God didn't speak the truth or or I don't know what happened, but certainly the they did not die as God had said. And and yet we know, oh, yes they did die that very day because the Bible speaks of man being dead in trespasses and sins, dead in their soul. But the important thing is God did not specify that. He did not emphasize the spiritual death. He just made a general statement, you will die. And and so someone could have accused God of of nothing happening in the day that Adam and Eve ate of the tree, just like people accuse uh, God that nothing happened on May 21. Well, you don't think anything happened. You certainly don't see anything with your physical eyes. But with the God of the Bible, that is not always the answer. And just look at how he brought judgment on the churches. We, uh, He gave the cup of his wrath to the churches, it says in Jeremiah 25. And yet the churches operated smoothly. Uh, in in an outward sense, there was no destruction. They didn't become a desolate wilderness. We didn't we don't we didn't see um, the stones of church buildings laid down, so not one was upon another. Literally, none of that happened. They they didn't they acted as if nothing had happened during the 23 years. But did anything happen? True believers know it did. Oh, certainly, God severely judged them by removing his Holy Spirit and by setting up Satan. And to the outward observer, you don't see a thing. So, it, you know, some people act like it's a crazy idea that a spiritual judgment came on May 21. And, and it could be because they don't have any spiritual eyes to see. It, 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 you know, uh, the Bible is a spiritual book, and we have to look with the eyes of faith and and faith is the substance of things not seen. And Amen. and so we find in the Bible that God continues to point to May 21, 2011 as judgment day. There's been no correction of the timeline. There's been no um no one who said, "Oh, look at this. This is where the error was." No. It, it, every time I or others go back and look it over, it's still correct, which means the Bible is still insisting that was the day of judgment. And it's insisting because it was so. And and that's the correction we need to make. We need to recognize, number one, spiritual judgments do exist, and, and there's much biblical support for that. And number two, one of them just took place but thank you thank you for bringing up that verse and let's go to the next person on the phones welcome to our sunday evening question and answer time yes echo 2011 asks can you explain first chronicles chapter 21 verse 1 why did god get angry with david for counting the israelites also can Satan still provoke Christians today? Yeah, um, this is a good question. It says in First Chronicles 21.1, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now, let's compare what we read in, um, I think it's Second Samuel. Second Samuel. 24 verse 1 which is the parallel passage uh, it says and again the anger of Jehovah was kindled against Israel and he moved David against them to say go number Israel and Judah now if you compare the two one says Satan provoked David the other says the Lord moved David and and that's because uh, God um, when he he accomplishes his will. He may also use Satan uh, to to get involved. And God is the one who controls 
the movements of Satan. He restrains him, he looses him. And so if he allowed Satan any leeway here and, and um, to, to get involved in this, it, it could be said that the Lord did it. And on the other hand, Satan is the one who, who actually did it. And so it could be correctly said that he did it. But, but anyway, um, as far as the numbering of Israel and God's judging um, uh, or, or bringing judgment upon Israel for it, you know, th this is fairly complicated. Um, there are statements made in these two uh, parallel passages in 2 Samuel 24 and 1, 1 Chronicles 21 that even appear contradictory, but none of them are. Um, we, we need to look at the numbers of people um, that were numbered in order to, to, to go somewhere else in the Bible uh, to give a further explanation. It says in 2 Samuel 24, in verse 9, And Joab gave up the sum of the number of the people unto the king, and there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men that drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000 men. So we're given two numbers, 800,000 in Israel of valiant men that drew sword, and 500,000 men of Judah. Notice it doesn't call the men of Judah valiant, and it doesn't say they drew sword. Now, going back to 1 Chronicles 21, it says in verse 5, And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David, and all they of Israel were a thousand thousand and a hundred thousand men that drew sword. Now, that's one million one hundred thousand. It's three hundred thousand more than the 800,000 mentioned in the other passage. And then uh, it goes on, and Judah was 403 score and 10,000 men that drew sword. That's 470,000, 30,000 less than is mentioned in the other passage. And also, it, some added information is there um, concerning Judah. Notice it says 470,000 men that drew sword. In the other passage, it just said men. It didn't say they, they drew sword. So we have two different numbers. This, um, in, in 1 Chronicles 21.5, there are more Israelites and less men of Judah. And in the other passage, there are um, more uh, people from Judah mentioned than 1 Chronicles and less Israelites or uh, the 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 men who drew sword and we wonder well how can both of these be accurate and that's what we have to start with we know the Bible is perfect we know there are no errors there there are no scribal errors which is what some theologians um claim when when they come upon these types of uh, apparent contradictions or discrepancies between passages they say oh it was a a scribal slip of the pen that the the scribe meant to write a certain number but there was an error and and as soon as they do that they fail the test that God has set up this is a test like everything else in the bible it's a test to see if we trust the Bible. Do we trust that the Bible is the Word of God and, and perfect, without error of any kind? And many in the churches fail the test right here. And they would quickly uh, try to avoid passages like this or, or not deal with them. Or if pressed, they'll say, well, yeah, from time to time. There was a scribal error, but we believe the Bible is 99.9% .9 faithful and can be trusted. Well, that little percentage of a of percent is enough to drive home the edge of the wedge. And as soon as you allow for the littlest error, 
you lose the trustworthiness of the whole Bible. That's what Satan strives for. That's what the enemy strives for, to get you to doubt the littlest bit, to think that just a word, just a jot, just a tittle is an error. And and then he knows if he can get that crack, that opening in your mind, then he can begin to work on it. And, and you get the edge of the wedge in the crack, and then you drive the hammer blow home, and it splits it wide open. And the true believer does not give that little crack. Oh, no, the Bible is perfect. And we don't say that just just out of stubbornness. We say it out of honest understanding that God has granted us. There are no mistakes. And it's only uh, apparent contradictions. The problem isn't with the Bible. The problem is in our inability to fully understand it. And so we sometimes have to say, well, I don't know how the two can be harmonized, but uh, I, I know they can be, and I'll just wait patiently till God grants me understanding. Now, in this case, we can harmonize these two passages. The 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 key phrase is drew sword and valiant men and israel had 1,100,000 men that drew sword it says in first chronicles 21:5 to draw sword is a uh, a phrase that means you are of age to carry a sword it, it, we would say today you are of age to be drafted you could be drafted into the military. You're 18 or 21, whatever it is. And so you would you would be of age to carry a gun in the military, to do service. And and that's what this phrase means. Um, we, we won't turn there, but in the book of Judges, Gideon had a son. And, and at one time, Gideon um, found his enemies, and he told his son to arise and slay them. And the son feared because he was a youth. And and the, the, the phrase draw sword was involved there. He could not draw sword because he was afraid that he was a youth. And that is, he wasn't old enough. And, and that's what that phrase means. So that helps us to realize that all the men of Israel... 1,100,000 that were counted in the census that Joab was performing, all of them were old enough. They were all over the age of 20, let's say. And, and so they all could draw sword. But there's another word, valiant, that is used back in 2 Samuel 24 to also describe 800,000 of them. Even though all 1,100,000 were of age, only 800,000 were valiant men. And, and that would uh, probably indicate that they were perhaps more um, veterans. They, they were, they were um, familiar with battle. They, they had already been in war. But 300,000 others who were qualified because they drew a sword, yet were not valiant men because they had not yet entered into battle. So God, he, he gives us those key words, and he makes these two statements to give the appearance of error. And yet there is no error. Both statements are correct. Now with Judah in Second Samuel 24, let me read that again. It says in verse 9, the last half, the last part of the verse, and the men of Judah were 500,000 men. That's it. It does not say they drew sword. In 1 Chronicles 21, 5, um, and Judah was 403 score and 10,000 men that drew sword. Now, we, we know that Joab numbered 500,000 men of Judah. But of that number, 470,000 were qualified, they were of age to carry a sword to do battle. They, in other words, they were of draft age. And it must mean 
that 30,000 of them were numbered that were not qualified. Now, now we're getting to the, the, the root of the problem of the numbering of the people of Israel. We wonder um, why that was such a, a bad thing, why God brought such a harsh judgment upon Israel. Well, it, uh, the, there were 30,000 individuals of Judah numbered that should not have been numbered. And the Bible tells us this if we turn to First Chronicles chapter 27. It says in verse 23, But David took not the number of them from twenty years old and under, because Jehovah had said he would increase Israel like to the stars of the heavens. Joab, the son of Zariah, began to number, but he finished not because there fell wrath for it against Israel. Neither was the number put in the account of the chronicles of King David. You see, this is the explanation, that David refused to take the number of individuals under age 20 that Joab had numbered, and that would be 30,000 and Notice that that number was not put in the account of Chronicles. And it happens to be in Chronicles that we have the lesser number of the men of Judah. And wrath fell for it um, be, because individuals were being numbered that should not have been numbered. Now David and, and his pride are also in view, and David, as a good leader uh, takes full responsibility for uh for this numbering error and and it, he realizes it's all his fault after all he's the one who put Joab in in the position of authority to carry it out and he should have known better because Joab is, had been nothing but a thorn in his side uh in many ways and and so uh, wrath does fall for it upon Israel. But thank you for that question. And let's go to the next person on the phones. Welcome to eBible Sunday Evening Question and Answer. Hi, Chris. Uh, I wonder if you had an opportunity to look at Isaiah 23, um, 17 and 18. We know that it's talking about the uh, the end of the 70 years, which believe identifies with the end of the 23 years of the Great Tribulation, but um, the language of, uh, I wonder if you had an opportunity to, uh, if you or if you could explain verse 18, the language there and all the pronouns and just uh, it's very confusing. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know if I can fully explain it, but let's, let's it, it helps just to read these things sometimes. Let's look at Isaiah 23 and verse 15. It shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten 70 years. Now, Tyre is used, um, as well as Tarshish, as a type of the corporate church. And notice they're forgotten 70 years, and 70 years does identify with the 70-year judgment when God brought Babylon upon Judah and and uh, uh that, that typified the great tribulation and the end of the church age and and uh the twenty three year period uh we we just finished and so this seventy years I think would also relate to that it in other words, the seventy years is representing the duration the full twenty three year great tribulation and notice it says tires shall be forgotten seventy years according to the days of one king now we it would be good to read Revelation 17 to understand that reference to one king. It says in uh, verse 10, uh, there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. These are the, the uh, 
representative of the seven kingdoms or rules of Satan throughout time. Five have fallen, and this is written in the first century A.D., so it would be the rule of Satan up until that point. One is, he he continues to be active throughout the church age, and one is to come where he continues a short space. That would be when he is loosed for a little season of the Great Tribulation. And, and and so Tyre is forgotten 70 years according to the days of one king, and that one king would identify with the rule of Satan when he's loosed for the little season of the Great Tribulation. After the end of 70 years shall Tyre sing as a harlot. And the interesting thing about this is it is speaking of a time after the seven years, and, and therefore a time period which comes after the Great Tribulation. Tyre, again, would be typifying the church. The church is still around today. We, the church hasn't disappeared after the 23 years. They're, they're still in the world. And notice that she's singing as a harlot that is bringing the gospel as um, someone who is unfaithful, adulterous, someone involved in spiritual fornication, as the church is today. Take a harp, go about the city, thou harlot, thou hast been forgotten, make sweet melody, sing many songs that thou mayest be remembered. And it would be describing, I think, ongoing activity that the churches are still involved with um, at this time. Verse 17, it shall come to pass after the end of 70 years that Jehovah will visit Tyre and she shall turn to her hire and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. And that's why she's called a harlot. And she's, she's still involved with spiritual fornication and, and it's with every nation in the world. And her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to Jehovah. It shall not be treasured nor laid up. For her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before Jehovah to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. Now this is the difficult language that I don't understand. I know it somehow relates to Zechariah 14, um, which I'll read. But I, I really can't answer exactly what God is doing. If you look at the last two verses of Zechariah 14, verses 20 and 21, it it says, In that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in Jehovah's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto Jehovah of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and see therein. And, well, is that the verses I meant? Well, I... I I've looked it up, and it's led me there before. I can't exactly put my finger on the connection right now. But um, the last verse, or la the parts of ver both of those verses, I, I don't understand at this time. But thank you for bringing up that question. And let's go to the next person. Welcome to eBible's Question and Answer. Hello, Chris. Yes, hello. Oh, yes. Okay, um... Thank you so much for the study. Um, can you please try to answer Proverbs 30, verse 9? It seems to be two-parted. Thank you. Okay, Proverbs 30, verse 9. Let's uh, back up a little. Let me begin reading from verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add uh, thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be full, and deny thee, and say, Who is Jehovah? Or lest I be poor, and steal, and take the name of my God in vain. Well, this idea here is is uh, carrying over from verse 8. Um, give me neither poverty 
nor riches, feed me with food convenient for me. That is, that which is sufficient. And and I think that would be the key to understanding this, because the Bible tells us, my grace is sufficient. So we don't want over much, and we don't want less. We only want that which is sufficient, the grace of God. And 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 so, um, lest I be full and deny thee, that is, wanting more than the grace of God, or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain, that is, having less than the grace of God. So, um, that I think that would be how to understand that verse. Is that somehow also uh, implying that... Um, to to sin because it mentions uh, steal is sort of taking God's name in vain. Yeah, well, there are the um, the literal commandments: Thou shalt not steal, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, and to physically steal is breaking the commandment, or to take God's name in vain is breaking the commandment. But there are also spiritual aspects to those commandments, and and um, it, it, it stealing could be done in a spiritual sense. But I, I think I understand taking the name of God in vain much better. So let me talk about that. It, when someone says they're a Christian, they have taken the name of Christ. Remember in Isaiah, we find seven women. Um, who who want to be called by thy name. And that's basically all professed Christians are are taking the name of Christ. We have taken his name. Now, if we're truly born again, that's fine. That's fitting. And, and there's no sin involved. But if we're not truly born again, if we're not actually a child of God, then we're not actually a Christian, and we've taken God's name in vain. It it it's a um, it, it's an empty thing that will do nothing for us, and and I think that would be uh, what's in view here. You see, when someone wants to add to the Word of God, you know, God's Word is is sufficient, or if they want to take away from the Word of God. In a sense, maybe that's what the stealing is. They're they're trying to um, not uh, have the full, complete word of God. Then, then individuals are are not just uh, going to the Bible in, in the proper way, and they're giving evidence they're not true believers, and and so they've taken His name in vain. Thank you so much, Chris. Have a good night. Thank you for bringing up that verse. And, uh, well, uh, I think we have time for just one more. Let's go to the next person. And welcome to our Sunday evening question and answer. Raggle1125 asks, Please explain Leviticus 26, verse 26. We don't understand this verse. Leviticus 26 26 says, And when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven. They shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and shall eat and not be satisfied. Now this um, this passage is describing judgments that come upon those that are not obedient to the word of God. It begins back in verse 21. If you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you. And therefore, it would apply to the corporate churches, the um, the corporate body of churches and congregations of the world which have been disobedient to the word of God. And as a result, God has broken the staff of their bread. Now that phrase has to do with um, instituting a famine. They're not a famine of actual bread or water, but as it says in Amos 8.11, a famine of hearing. 
which took place in the churches. It's as though the bread of life, the Lord Jesus Christ, has been removed, and, and he was. And ten women shall bake your bread in one oven. The ten women, just like the seven women found, uh, I think, in Isaiah 4, are also typifying the church, but this would be describing the completeness, excuse me, of those that are associated with the the church, and and they're involved in bringing the gospel or baking bread in the oven, and they shall deliver your bread again by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. There there is no uh, there is not enough. It is not sufficient. And again, going back to the the previous caller. God's grace is sufficient. There is no grace to satisfy the spiritual hunger that that actually exists in the people in the churches. This, they're uh, due to their sins, and and so there is no satisf- satisfaction in that sense. That phrase "not be satisfied" is a is a phrase that indicates judgment. Um, it's found. A few times in Amos, in Amos 4, um, let's see, oh, might have jumped the gun here. Yeah, I, I haven't looked at this for a while, so I'm sorry, I know it's in the book of Amos, but uh, I can't find it right now. It's It's a phrase that indicates being under the wrath of God. But thank you for uh, your question and for bringing up that verse. And I would like to thank everyone for sharing your questions and your comments, and especially for bringing up the Bible verses we had an opportunity to read and consider. Lord willing, we'll be back again tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, with our ongoing Bible study in the book of 1 Samuel. But for for now, I'll say good night. May the Lord's perfect will be done. And thank you for joining us here on eBible Fellowship Sunday afternoon questions and answers time. You can hear this broadcast each and every Sunday around 1 o'clock Eastern. And don't forget, you can also join us for yet another live questions and answers time Friday evenings at about 9.30 p.m. Eastern. Until then, have a pleasant Sunday afternoon and may the Lord's perfect will be done.